many, many years ago, um, a guy came into my office, a young man came into my office. He needed to talk. He and his family had been members of the church ever since he was a kid. In fact, I had known him ever since he was a kid. And that was one of the reasons why he came to talk to me. He started out the conversation by saying this. He said, what good does it do, Craig? You see, what I knew, without him even having to tell me, because I had been walking this journey with him, what I knew was that a few months before, he had lost his job, not through any um, uh, fault of his own. The circumstances had changed for his employer, and the job was just not needed anymore. So he had spent the last few months um, trying to find another job, and it hadn't been going very well. In fact, it hadn't gone so well that he was really at the end of his rope financially, emotionally, and spiritually, and that's what brought him to my, to my office. You see, what happens is, but it's not unusual for people to come and talk to the pastor, but usually they come to talk to the pastor when they're kind of at the end of the rope. They're kind of, they come when they, when they have questions, and usually uh, the questions are asked, and then they, they make a decision. And these were the questions he was asking. What good does it do? Basically, what he was saying was, um, I've been, me and my family have been coming to church and serving God all of our lives, and then this happens. What good did it do me? Where is God in the midst of all of this? Why isn't God answering my prayer and fixing this? You ever been there? I bet you have. You see, it's not unusual for people to be in that place, to kind of have, uh, being face the, the troubles of life uh, and then not feel as though God is there. Or if He is there, why did he allow it to happen? Why doesn't he fix it? So, you, when you come to the pastor and you ask these questions, basically one of two things, as I said before, uh, is happening. If I can answer the question satisfactorily, um, they have enough strength and courage and fortitude to go on to, to face the problems in the future, or they just get mad because it wasn't a very good answer, which happens. They don't get mad at me. They get mad at God. As I said, that's not um, an unusual story, is it, sadly to say. If you've ever been there, if you've ever been in that place where you found yourself in the midst of trouble and you've wondered where God is and why God doesn't fix it, um, I'm glad you're here today. Because um, I want to share with you th some things this morning that I think might help. But I'm going to warn you, some of the things that I have to share with you this morning may shock you a little bit. Um, and you may not like them, to be quite honest with you. For example, though it isn't God generally who causes the troubles in your life, trouble is one of God's greatest servants. Did you know that? Let me say that again. Even though it's not uh, God that causes most of the troubles in your life, trouble is one of God's greatest servants. Now, how can that be? Well, um, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about um, how the troubles of your life are actually or can actually be used by God as a servant for your good. As we unpack these keys, as we just try to discover the, the keys to unlock the power of prayer, we're going dis, to discuss the role that trouble plays. If you've been reading the book, um, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire with us, that's what we've been doing here at Prairie Bible Church the last couple of weeks. We're doing it individually, many of us are. Some of us are doing them in, in Sunday schools or in life groups, that's good. You may remember this story happened towards the very beginning. Um, the story was that Pastor Simbola, who is the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, which is kind of the story which this book revolves around, right? We, we remember the story where he was, um, he received his call to ministry and he said yes to it, correct? And almost immediately upon receiving his call to ministry, um, he starts experiencing troubles of life, right? 
he, he discuss, people start leaving the church they've been leaving before, but they're still leaving. And they don't have enough money uh, to even put food on the table because somebody's stealing from the offering. And then to top it all off, he gets chronically sick. So he finds himself um, basically without reserves spiritually, uh, emotionally, and physically. Till so one day he finally just says, I've had it, I can't do it. And he cries out to God. He says, God, you're my only hope. If we are ever to turn things around at, at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, the only hope we have is you. You see, up to this particular point, he had been operating under the misconception, a misconception that I'm going to guess many of you are operating under today. You came to church operating under this misconception, and the misconception is this. The circumstance of my life, my life, what's going on, it's up to me. I need to be smart enough, I need to be strong enough, I need to be spiritual enough, I need to work hard enough so that things work out. Now those are all good and normal, normal kind of uh, American virtues, right? Nothing wrong with them. But when we labor under, under those misconceptions that that's what life expects out of us, more specifically that that's what God expects out of us, we often find ourselves feeling overwhelmed and overcome. Because often because of the troubles of life, no matter how hard we work, no matter um, how skilled we are, It's not enough. Well, anyway, finally, he cries out to God. He said, I can't do it. The only hope I have, the only hope that, per, that, uh, that Brooklyn Tabernacle has is you, Jesus. I can't do this anymore. And what, what happens then? God speaks to him. He says, God, you finally got there. I can do something through you now. This is where I've wanted you all along. And I'm going to promise you something, Pastor. I'm going to promise that if you and your wife will call my people to pray, not only will I give you all that you need, but you won't be able to build a building big enough to, um, to fit all the people that I'm going to bring you. Pretty cool story. And then as you read the rest of the story, you understand just how cool it is. But let me ask you a question. What was the turning point of that story? When did the paradigm shift occur? It occurred because of the trouble. Trouble was the catalyst the story went from depressing to hopeful in that moment when the trouble drove him to cry out to God right now some of you at this point you should be asking well does it have to work that way do do we have to go through the the troubles of life. Did he have to go through the troubles that he was going through in order to get to that place where the story went from depressing to, to hopeful? Well, that's a really good question. And to be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I honestly, I think Jesus would love it if we human beings would kind of just choose every day to start the day by saying, Lord, um, I'm not enough. Lord Jesus, I can't do this. You're my only hope to face the circumstances of the day. I think he would wish that that's the way we would start every day, but that's not human nature, is it? You know what most of us do when we start every day? Especially if everything has been going pretty well, most of us get up going, you know, I can do this. In fact, Lord, everything's been going so well, as a matter of fact, that there's a lot of people out there in the world today that could use your help a lot more than I could. In fact, things have been going so well for me that, um, that maybe I'll do a few things for you today. Now, we never say it that way, do we? But that's the way we live, generally, when there aren't any troubles. 
So, does it have to be? I don't know that it has to be. But more times than not, that's the thing. Troubles are the thing that have the potential to bring about the change that is necessary. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 50, verse 15, the one that, that we had read just a moment ago, that's why he said it's in the midst of our troubles that we cry out to God. It's because of our troubles that we cry out to God and God intercedes for us. And then we bring Him glory. In other words, without trouble, we're far less likely to recognize the need for God, the need for Jesus in our lives. Without trouble, we are far less likely to to cry out and to pray. And without trouble, we are far less likely to give God the glory when He answers. Which, by the way, brings us back to another little question. What about those moments when God doesn't answer? When it seems like God doesn't answer, right? Because here's the deal. God is always answering. Sometimes His answer is no. Sometimes his answer is wait. And here, hold on for just a second. Sometimes his answer is something that you didn't want. In fact, I would, I would go so far as to say that in those moments when you're shaking your fist at God and you're saying, God, why don't you fix this? Why don't you give me a job? It's because you've wanted him to answer it your way rather than to receive the answer his way. Just something to think about. But I want to reiterate something to you this morning. I want you to remember again that generally it isn't God that brings the trouble. It's God that uses the trouble as a servant. Now how, how can I be sure that God isn't the one that generally brings the trouble? Because he doesn't have to. Because there is one thing that every one of you are really good at. And that's creating trouble all by yourself. Now, how do I know that? I don't, I don't know all you all that well. But what I do know is that you are sinners. Not very politically correct. I apologize, but it's the truth. And generally, trouble is birthed from sin. Which means that trouble, for the most part, is inescapable. Now again, some people might say, well, does that mean that, that all trouble is inescapable? No, you, you know as well as I do that if you're, if there are certain things, certain decisions that you can make in your life that if you choose to, to do this and not do that or vice versa, you're probably going to avoid a whole bunch of problems, a lot, a lot of trouble. But the fact of the matter is, even if you're avoiding trouble, Somebody else isn't, and it spills over onto you, right? Which means, ultimately, trouble is inevitable. That feels depressing until you realize you're not powerless. It is true that trouble is inevitable, but you're not powerless in the face of trouble. When faced with the troubles of life, you have a choice. You have power. And the choice is, I can let the, the trouble define me, depress me, and discourage me. Or I can use it as a catalyst to cry out to Christ. Which do you choose? Now, some people would say, well, that's just the power of positive thinking. That's, you, you can't change things that way. That's wrong. That is absolutely not the truth. You have power. We've been, we're, we're talking about how, what are the keys to unpacking the power of prayer. This is one of the greatest discoveries 
of your life potentially. If only you could learn to use your troubles as a catalyst rather than as a defining moment. It can define your moments, but let it be a moment that drives you to your knees and, and causes you to cry out to Jesus. It's your choice. And when you choose correctly, it changes everything. It changes the way you look at every circumstance of life. It doesn't take away the pain always, and, I, and it shouldn't necessarily. But it can, it can change from discouragement and depression to hope simply by being driven to your knees and recognizing and calling out and saying, God, I can't do this. This is more than I ever anticipated. If there is any hope for my future, the only hope I have is you. And that's at the moment that God says, good, now we're in a place where we can do something. And some of you might say, well, can you take away the pain? He'll say, no, because even the pain has a purpose. That doesn't mean he won't comfort you in the midst of your grief. It doesn't mean that, um, that he's going to give you a job the next day. It just means that when he doesn't, it's because he has a purpose that you never dreamed or imagined. There's a purpose in the midst of it that you never dreamed or imagined because you've got it stuck in your head that you want it done this way rather than God's way. It changes everything. And you get to choose. One of the keys to unlocking the power of prayer is choosing to decide how you're going to view trouble, the inevitable troubles of life. It changes everything. Let's pray. Lord, as I, as I am standing before my brothers and sisters this morning preaching this message with, I hope, what seems as confidence in its truth, I confess to you that um, I don't always live it. There are times in the midst of the, the troubles of life that I get so focused on the troubles that I forget to cry out. That I forget the promises that you've made. It says in Isaiah 26, 3, I believe, it says, For those that fix their minds on the Lord, they shall experience peace. Because in so doing, they demonstrate the fact that they trust in Him. May we, in the midst of the troubles of life, Lord, remember to fix our minds on You. When the troubles are crying out and threatening to overwhelm every circumstance of life and it's the only voice that we can hear in our ear, may we listen to that still small voice that says, I am here. Cry out to me and I will deliver you. And then don't forget. Don't forget to bring me praise to offer me the praise recognizing that I am indeed your only hope that I am indeed the one who delivers you from the storm that comforts you in your grief that is the power of prayer Amen